Oh, thank you so much. Um, really excited to be here and to give this presentation uh, regarding uh, pipelines, optimizing pipelines, and continuous delivery. So uh, put a little agenda together for uh, this presentation. Um, oh, and before I move on to the, uh, the agenda, uh, if anyone has any questions throughout this uh, presentation, please uh, leverage or ask the questions in the uh, Q&A uh, portion of Zoom. Um, I'll be monitoring as I'm you know, going through the presentation. Uh, I'm gonna go through a, a couple of concepts um, th that may you know, <laughs> be a little overwhelming for some folks. Uh, so I definitely want to uh, answer questions as we go through this. Um, it's not rocket science, but you know, uh, the, we're talking concepts and stuff. So definitely um, ask your questions as you uh, you know think of them, and I will try to you know, monitor this as best I can and then answer it in real time. So uh, without further ado, let's talk about the agenda. So uh, today I'm just going to be discussing uh, software development processes and life cycles. Uh, and as they relate to continuous delivery. Uh, then I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, continuous delivery at scale, which is essentially um, flagging a few things that you should be looking for, some of the things that can go wrong when you're um, uh, performing continuous delivery at scale. And then finally, uh, I'll spend uh, some time talking about how you can optimize pipelines, make them more efficient uh, and some you know, tips on how you can easily implement, uh, you know, changes that will help you uh, manage uh, the efficiency a little bit better. Uh, so yeah, let's jump over to a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I am, my name is Angel Rivera, developer advocate uh, for CircleCI. Uh, so my role as a developer advocate essentially uh, is for me to go out to the community and discuss uh, you know, technology and how folks are using technology. I'm also engaging at a grassroots level with developers uh, to get a better sense of you know, their bottlenecks with certain technologies, some of the struggles they're having, as well as offer up some advice on how they can you know, fix those issues or, or, or resolve them. Uh, but it also serves as a really good uh, kind of data collection uh, for, for me and my team. And uh, once I have those learnings uh, from the community, I can bring them back uh, to our teams at CircleCI. And we incorporate those learnings into our design processes for pro you know, product releases and, and, and upgrades so that we can bring better uh, value and better features, uh, useful features to the community. Um, we're all about developers and trying to make their lives easier uh, and learning what, struggles they have is really helpful when we're developing features to help uh, you know, uh, resolve some of those issues within the platform. Uh, if anybody wants to reach out to me, uh, I'm pretty much available on Twitter all the time. It's the best way to get a hold of me. So if you want to reach out, just hit me up at Punk Data on Twitter and uh, I will respond accordingly. So it's enough about me. Let's talk about software development life cycles and continuous delivery. Uh, Pretty exciting stuff, right? Uh, but before we jump into all of that, I wanted to kind of give you a foundational um, overview of software development life cycles, what they are and what, what, what's, what's their purpose, if, if folks don't know. Uh, but it's essentially uh, the rules for uh, software development that uh, teams and organizations uh, develop and use them to govern how they build their software, right? So this essentially are the rules that people build for themselves and their software development processes, uh, which then are you know, shared amongst the teams and then um, used as the guide to, to building that software. Uh, so, you know, software development life cycles come in many, many different flavors. Um, right now I'm showing you two of the more dominant uh, software development lifecycle uh, methodologies used. Uh, one is called waterfall development and the other is agile development. Waterfall development is the process where, you know, it's more of a cascading model and tasks are designed and then uh, assigned to developers more in a, in a bulk capacity. So uh, what I mean by that is if you look at the diagram for waterfall, 
that's a dotted square box around those three uh, elements within the, the, the methodology. Uh, developers are, are given you know, these, these tasks to complete, just like any other job, right? You get your tasks, you have to uh, accomplish those tasks in order to achieve your goals. Uh, within software development, though, in the waterfall uh, development methodology, uh, it's, it's more uh, sequential, right? So there's a lot of dependencies on getting a task done prior to moving on to the next task, which, as you can imagine, can create a lot of bottlenecks and blockage, right? Because you're having those dependencies. Um, and Waterfall has been around for quite some time, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, but the problem with Waterfall is it's very inefficient, especially when you have a huge group of developers trying to develop that software uh, as you, like, you can imagine, you know, that cascading effect will trickle down and create huge uh, uh, inefficiencies in the software development process. Under Waterfall back in the day, uh, when I started developing software, you know, it would take us weeks, months, to, and years sometimes to release new software, which is pretty bad for a developer because, you know, you could be working on something uh, and a year later it gets released and then you have to kind of, um, you know, shift your mindset to that previous context of a year ago and, you know, to fix things or, or to make enhancements. So, you know, I really didn't enjoy it. Uh, but then, you know, as developers and engineers, we figured out that, hey, this waterfall development process is probably not the best for, uh, you know, developing software and we can do it more efficiently. And that's kind of where agile development was born. Um, if you look at that diagram, you can see a lot of movement, right? There's arrows, there's circles, um, but one of the key elements to or differences between waterfall and, and agile is um, agile actually breaks that cascading model and uh, implements a, a more of a uh, you know smaller scope uh, uh, and concurrent tasks uh, so essentially right uh, when you have a agile development uh, methodology you're building your software concurrently so your developers are working on smaller tasks right smaller in scope uh, in order for them to like, you know, really focus in on the thing that they need to accomplish. And then uh, they're continuously uh, pushing changes, right? So you can see all those circles where you have a sprint and then it just, you know, gets processed, uh, passes over to like a daily scrum and some scrum master in the center there is, is orchestrating all of this. So again, right, um, it's an incremental way of building software, which is Really, really nice because um, again, tasks are broken down smaller. You can be super laser focused on things, uh, and you're not, you know, submitting huge uh, code changes, which could take, you know, a lot of time to review. Uh, in any case, that's this is uh, the software development lifecycle, which I'll also refer to as uh, software development processes. So if you hear those two terms, they are the same. So. With Agile kind of, you know, bringing uh, efficiencies and, and optimizations to the way we build software, um, you know, that's a process or a concept within a process for your, your software development processes. Uh, continuous delivery is essentially, uh, you know, born out of uh, these findings that, you know, we can do things concurrently and we can deliver software much, much faster. Uh, so with continuous delivery, it, essentially, um, it was the practice of building and testing software and then also delivering those changes to code and uh, uh, changes to code and user environments using automated tools. So right um, with continuous delivery, we noticed that the agile pattern of, you know, a smaller uh, work do, doing work in smaller scopes uh, and then also the iterative or concurrent uh, practice of building software can be applied to how we deliver software. So, you know, those two methodologies, um, and then we bring in continuous delivery on that to kind of facilitate releasing that code faster. Um, so within continuous delivery, though, we have another concept called continuous integration and continuous deployment. These two concepts are actually separate, uh, but they're often, uh, you know, discussed uh, at, at the same time, which is kind of why you hear, see and hear and see this acronym CICD, stands for Continuous Integration, Continuous Deployment. Uh, and again, two separate concepts, which are generally 
addressed at the same time because they are so intercoupled and, and related. Uh, so let's talk about continuous integration. Um, it's simply the practice of merging all developers working copies to a shared code repository. So what does that mean? Um, within the principles of CI, um, that means you're writing and committing code as often as possible, right? So you're committing code to a branch or some sort of repository a trunk. Uh, and then those uh, committed uh, changes are shared and committed to a, a or they're committed to a shared code repository. So that uh, the reason you're doing that is your team can actually understand and see what, you know, how you're building uh, the features in your, in your code. Um, and it's also a way for you, the developer, to pull down your peers' changes and the stuff they're working on and understanding, you know, kind of where they're going with their code so that you can have that nice, uh, comfortable merge uh, of, of functionality, especially if you're overlapped, right? And you're, you're touching code uh, in an overlap kind of sense. So um, the other benefit or, or, or I would say uh, element to, to uh, the principles of, of continuous integration is you're testing your code on every commit. So this is adding a layer of quality, uh, you know, on the, the, from the developer's perspective, every time they make code changes and then are committed. You're testing the, those, those changes. And then my favorite uh, uh, feature or, or, or benefit from, from the principles of CI is uh, the fast feedback loops, right? So as we're testing our code on every commit, um, we're able to understand or know if we have issues with our code because the tests are either going to fail or they're, I mean, they're going to pass or they're going to fail. And if they're failing, you definitely want to know, right, as quickly as possible so that you can go back and fix those issues and then resubmit them, right, to the whole the continuous delivery process. So fast feedback loops is, is one of the key uh, uh, benefits for me, at least, uh, as a developer from uh, CI. Now, with continuous deployment, it's just the practice of deploying this new software or the changes that you uh, created, right? And you're releasing it to your target audience, target environments. Um, this is more on the side of basically, you know, deploying software as, as the name indicates. So with the principles of continuous deployment, we are creating release artifacts for uh, continuous delivery or continuous deployment process. We're deploying uh, code artifacts to those target resources, could be a Kubernetes cluster, could be uh, just a simple, you know, uh, server somewhere that you're just hosting a website, whatever that it, the target environment is, doesn't matter, but you de the fact is that you're deploying these code artifacts to those, those environments. Uh, one of the other principles is sort of like va uh, app validation and services. Once everything's deployed, um, you could have a successful deployment, but then your applications could be, you know, failing miserably uh, as on the server that you deploy to. So, you know, you want to validate that those apps after deployment are, are functioning and the services are, uh, you know, uh, executing as, as expected. And then finally, um, in the CD or yeah, the continuous deployment uh, principles, uh, you want to establish some sort of um, monitoring or surveillance of the state of that application to ensure again that it's uh, functioning as expected. Uh, and also if you have any sort of resiliency or recovery type uh, you know, uh, uh, mechanisms within your, your, your application functioning, uh, you also wanna monitor that to make sure that it's recovering and uh, being resilient as designed. So you know, with continuous uh, uh, delivery CICD, uh, software development uh, processes, all of those things I mentioned are, are basically conceptual, right? These are things or guidelines that people uh, define and then operate under, uh, but none of it means anything without automation. And the reason I say that is the automation is what brings those concepts to life, right? They're the things that execute, uh, automation executes the uh, continuous delivery concepts and, and plans that we make. Uh, so wait, I have uh, a question here before I move on. Uh, so the question is how uh, how it tests the commit works for new features. Okay, so I think the question is um, let me let me rephrase this. Uh, so how does it? Okay, so 
So when you're testing the, the new feature, so um, uh, when I get further into the presentation, I think in, in a couple of slides, they'll probably be a little bit more clearer. Uh, but what will happen is since you're running automation in your, you know, uh, uh, on your code changes, part of the execution of a, C, a CICD pipeline is running tests, right? So if you define that in your CICD pipeline, uh, like, you know, run a unit test or something, it's going to happen every time code is committed and pushed upstream so that, you know, you're not doing it manually on your laptop. You can just let the system do it. Uh, hopefully that was, that was answered. Um, so, right. Getting back to automation um, again, you know, this is uh, automation is what brings all of these uh, processes to life. And um, we're going to talk about CICD pipelines, right? So when you have your automation now, the, uh, so, sorry, we have another question. Uh, testing comes under CI or CD, uh, both. My answer to that is both um, because CI pertains mainly to the developer side of things where you're like writing code and you know, you're doing that iterative testing. Um, but then on the continuous uh, deployment side, you also want to test and validate, right? So when you're validating something, you're usually testing it. Uh, meaning deployments, right? Maybe there's some security scans, maybe some regulatory scans in your deployment uh, patterns. Um, so the answer is both. Uh, but primarily, if you're talking about code, uh, it's generally in the CI process. So we're talking about CI CD pipelines, right? And automation. The automation itself is your, uh, Again, the, the, the mechanism right to execute um, with Circle CI as a platform, that's what we are. We are the automation that brings your, 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 your concepts to life, your continuous delivery and software development process to life. Um, and they're defined what, in what we call a CICD pipeline or continuous delivery pipeline. Uh, and those are built upon jobs, right? So if you look at this diagram, it's a quick snapshot of the Circle CI dashboard. And, and if you were to use uh, our tool. This is what kind of what you would see with your pipelines, as you can see, right? There's every every little square box there is in, in this area is a a job, right? It's a block of commands that perform a specific function. So if you can look, if you see at the the, the left bottom box is run tests, and if you work your way up, uh, we're building a Docker image, and then right, I'm also creating a, a Kubernetes cluster in this uh, example. Uh, but you can see it's going to you know, move from the left, excuse me, to the right as our pipelines succeed. So once you have that um, set up, right, uh, the CICD pipelines are really, really important for what I'm going to talk about next, which is uh, performing continuous delivery at scale. If there's any questions, yeah, there are some questions. Great. So before I move on, let me answer some questions here. So uh, what are the tools? Uh, uh, I guess, what are the tools used in CD? So in the context of Circle CI for our continuous deployment, if you're talking about that, which I assume you're talking about, um, the, the tooling is pretty much anything you use, right? So if you're using an Amazon AWS CLI to deploy things to, M uh, to Amazon, uh, if you're using that cloud provider, that's great. If you're using Google's uh, CLI to deploy to Google, that's that's also you know available and you can use that. Uh, you could even use uh, infrastructure's code te technology, such as uh, infra is uh, sorry, uh, such as uh, Terraform or Pulumi or Ansible, right? Whatever whatever tooling you want at CircleCI, we want to meet the developer where where they're at, so you can leverage any kind of tooling you want within that because it's it's just essentially automation, right? Um, and then the other question here is, is it a good idea to integrate, or I guess integrate CD into production environments? Yes. <laughs> if you ask me, yes, um, you should be doing that. There's a couple reasons. I mean, you could still have your staging, you could still have, you know, Q&A type uh, patterns within your software development and release cycles. Um, but I would definitely recommend, um, <clears throat> excuse me, going in and do, you know, leveraging uh, uh, continuous deployment in production. The reason is your production environment, you're never gonna be able to replicate it 100%, right? No matter how much you try, um, it's just not gonna, gonna you know, pan out for you. You're never gonna reach parity. Um, so you know, obviously you wanna control 
the way you deploy that and keep really good uh, controls around how that's deployed. But I would definitely, um, you know, recommend you start looking at, uh, uh, you know, implementing a production level deployments because that's the whole point, right? Is to get the code that you built to production as quickly as possible and as effortlessly as possible. And there's one more question here. Um, so I think both CI and CD needs feedback loop for automation. May I know your view of this? Uh, yeah, so yes, <laughs> feedback loops are exactly what is required to have a successful and efficient um, and, and uh, consistent uh, continuous delivery uh, uh, operation, right? So like the idea is to get things done as quickly as possible, but you wanna have quality built in, right? And, and by testing that helps ensure, it doesn't give you 100% feels, Right? It doesn't cover all the use cases, but it, it will minimize the risk that you introduce you know, some weird bug uh, because you didn't test. So, um, so let's go ahead and move on. Uh, I know there's some other questions here. Um, so my voice isn't clear. I'll try to speak up. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, let's go ahead and jump into continuous delivery. A lot of stuff to cover here. Um, so uh, with you know, talking about delivery, continuous delivery at scale, what I'm showing you here is a very generic, um, oh, is this, let me get rid of that. Okay, so uh, it's a very generic um, SDLC or software development lifecycle, uh, like I guess uh, pipeline. Um, and, you know, what CICD mainly focuses in on in this SDLC example is generally gonna be in the development, testing and deployment phases. Of, of your processes, right? So this is where marrying uh, CI, CD and, um, and into your software uh, process, development processes is really important uh, and, and most beneficial, I should say as well. Uh, because as we all know, right? Code and repositories grow over time. And that's where I'm talking about, um, you know, the, the complexities growing, uh, the, the volume of code grows, and you have to stay on top of all of that, you know, all of those things uh, and be able to, you know, uh, address them as soon as possible. Because if you're not maintaining uh, that growth, it's going to eventually like bite you, right? It's going to impact you negatively. Um, and establishing and maintaining mechanisms uh, for scaling, you know, that provides solid support for pipelines is very difficult to achieve without constant surveillance and interactive reviews, meaning, you know, constantly going back and checking are, are our processes, you know, kind of matching um, our, our continuous delivery uh, processes, right? So that happens. Um, and that's what I call like a misaligned CICD segment. Um, and that can get you into some trouble as well. So when your processes are not properly aligned, uh, you know, you can start introducing huge, uh, you know, inefficiencies, slowing the pipeline and release processes down. Uh, you can also substantially uh, hurt your um, quality, right, of the, of the code. Um, one of the things that um, happens here is if you're looking at this diagram, uh, I'm showing you like, you know, the development phase, things are kind of out of whack. They're not really properly aligned with your software development processes or your guidelines. Um, this happens a lot when teams are interested in kind of, you know, not working in a, 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 in a, in a controlled process. Um, it does happen occasionally uh, amongst teams and within organizations that, uh, you know, your software uh, development processes don't exactly match up with your continuous delivery processes. And that's where like, you know, everything's kind of out of whack in, in, in different layers. Um, so, but I'll be talking about that, uh, aligning these in, the, in a little bit here. So, um, so right, when you have these misaligned CICD segments, um, that starts to uh, introduce confusion among your teams, like who's doing what, when are they doing it? Why isn't the automation reflecting this? Because again, you know, your, your CICD or your continuous delivery uh, cycles or, or, or pipelines are a reflection of your software development uh, practices. And they, well, they should be at least. And when they're not aligned, um, it will diminish the quality of the code. Um, you'll actually waste a ton of cycles, development cycles, which is very expensive because again, developers are 
you know, very expensive. They're the most expensive piece to building software in most cases. And then it will definitely slow your relay cycles down dramatically. So one of the other things that um, when you're operating at scale is uh, directly attributed to the platform, CICD platform effectiveness. So again, the CICD platform um, uh, that I'm addressing here, uh, or at least an example is Circle CI. Uh, that's what we do. We provide the automation. We are the CICD platform for your, for your pipelines. Um, and you must ensure that you have a platform that's very robust, very resilient, and that can scale. Um, CICD platforms come in many different flavors, many different companies. Um, they actually, so like, um, you know, Circle CI, we solely focus on uh, the uh, continuous delivery pipeline, um, whereas other, uh, you know, platforms, they may be uh, more of a, a all-in-one solution and CICD features are kind of bolted on uh, and, and they feel kind of bulky and, and slow and that CICD is really not their primary focus. Um, they may provide you some, you know, effective uh, CICD uh, performance on your platform, but as your, as again, as your, as your code and your project scale, uh, those solutions uh, the performance, if they're not scaling properly or being very resilient or ro robust, can can kind of hurt you in the end. So one of the advice uh, I'd give you is to look at your CI/CD platforms, evaluate them, make sure that they are, you know, filling the the needs that you have for your CI/CD pipeline and are able to scale with your workloads. So as you grow more members on your team, you know, the infrastructure needs to also be able to be uh, resilient, robust, and scale with your workloads. So um, one thing I will say, you know, teams really must understand that reliance on CI/CD tooling and execution is essential and will increase dramatically further, uh, cementing your CI/CD platforms as mission critical. And if they're not working properly, and you know you don't have CI/CD uh, capabilities for your team, um, it's going to cripple your productivity. So um, you you know. One emphasis here is to properly manage your your platforms. Make sure that, again that they're they're resilient, they're robust, and can scale with your workloads, and that they're properly being maintained. Um, that's one of the like huge efficiency killers. Is when your CI/CD platforms are not working properly, uh, you're going to be in 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 a world of hurt, right? As a software developer, as a as a software development team. So um, I'll stop here uh, to, before I jump into the next section. Uh, let's look at some questions. Uh, which programming language would you recommend for the automation? Oh, that's a good question. So the reason why, uh, yeah, so, so right, we're all developers. Um, the reason why this is a good question is uh, in general, um, most of the ICD platforms have settled on, and this isn't quite a language, it's a data structure in order to define your software Oh, I'm sorry, your continuous delivery pipelines. Uh, the language or the, sorry, the data structure, the syntax that we use is called YAML. And I'm sure if any of you have worked with any more modern cloud native type uh, uh, systems or solutions, you're probably quite familiar with what YAML is, which is the data structure. But we use, it's a, it's a human readable, uh, very highly declarative data structure that we use to define things. And one of the cool things we can do with it is define commands, right? So it's a nice, um, it's a nice syntax to use human readable. Um, it can get quite verbose and wordy, but at the end of the day, um, it is uh, what, what we use today. And actually most CICD modern, most modern CICD platforms are defining your pipelines within YAML. Um, any approval process? The next question is, are there any approval processes in this pipelines? So generally you don't wanna have that, right? Manual intervention in any pipeline, but there are situations where you need it, right? So like if you're in a regulatory space and you need to have some eyes on a, a segment or a job before you can continue and you need that manual approval, yes. Uh, at least at Circle CI, we have an approval process. Uh, you know, a, a, we call it an approvals job, and you can set that in your pipeline at any point you want to see. Uh, you know, some you want to stop the pipeline until someone manually can look at it and then let it go. You know, click the approval and it'll it'll proceed. Um, so yes, there are approval processes. 
Next question. Do you have any numbers regarding the performance of your machines versus the ones provided by Azure DevOps? Uh, I believe there are internally, there are some, some numbers. I don't know them. I don't have them. Uh, but yeah, um, we're, yeah, we probably have them. Um, if, if you want to have a further discussion on that, either hit me up on Twitter or on our Discord site, and we can see what we can do to see if we have some metrics we can share, but I'm not sure where that lives. Um, so the next question is, except, except static code scan, security testing, are there any other security features that we can implement in CI CD pipelines? Uh, the answer is you can implement, at least in the Circle CI platform, you can implement pretty much any kind of security, uh, you know, tooling or, or features or, or processes that, that you work with. Again, you know, Circle CI is designed to, 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 build, to uh, meet developers where they are. So we enable uh, you to run pretty much whatever you want uh, with, within reason on, in your, in your, uh, in your CI CD pipeline runtimes. So whatever tools you're using right now, uh, and by the way, that that's pretty much true across the board with with most uh, most CI, modern CI/CD tooling. There are limitations and restrictions, but uh, in general, yeah, you, you can pretty much run whatever you want, however you want, uh, within those platforms. Uh, is there the next question? Is there a best practice around making builds for different target OS environments in the pipeline? Yes, there are. Um, so, you know, it depends on um, everyone's case is different, but there are some common guidelines right that you can use to to build things um you know obviously when you're building uh, for different architectures so to speak like let's say you're building for uh x86 or arm which is what we introduced recently as well the capabilities are there to now natively build uh you know software for those two architectures um it's definitely something that's like you know again you can do it many many different ways uh, but I would say that, you know, uh, doing them efficiently is, is very important. So, um, you know, putting uh, an emphasis on, on optimizing those build processes so, so that they get done as quickly as possible. But you can implement pretty much whatever kind of build process you want for those architectures. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into optimizing pipelines. I think I answered all the questions. Um, so what I mentioned earlier was, you know, Circle CI, or not Circle CI, but uh, continuous delivery is, is really important. It's critical, mission critical for development teams to, to, to implement this and ensure that, um, you know, their pipelines are running efficiently. So the re one of the main reasons is, as I mentioned earlier, right, um, you don't want to waste any developer cycles, meaning you don't want humans sitting around waiting for, you know, uh, feedback on the code changes that they're making because your maybe your system is down or whatever, um, you know, whatever kind of situations. And the reason is, um, you know, we've calculated that the average cost of developers time per minute equals to about a buck or a dollar uh, and 45 cents, right? Every minute. So imagine if you had to, if you had, uh, let's say, I don't know, a hundred developers sitting around for 60 minutes because your CICD pipelines or your platform it's not functioning, right? It's, it's down. Um, it, it, the time wasted and the developer uh, cycles wasted is devastating. So um, it's in, in, it can get very, very expensive. So, you know, with that in mind, um, optimizing pipelines is super important. Uh, but you might be figure asking yourself, like, okay, so how the heck do I, you know, optimize, Angel? How do I? What do I look for? And I'm going to touch on a few things. Um, one of the ways that uh or one of the like easy ways to become inefficient or or your pipeline is becoming very slow and and not really and clunky right not not really streamlined uh is again by what i talked about earlier is having uh misaligned uh ci cd segments with your software development processes um and so remember this uh diagram um i was talking about how everything's kind of jacked up right not really aligned um but this is kind of like what you want to see uh, moving forward. You want to see that your development processes are properly aligned and executing in accordance with your guidelines, right? Um, you want to be testing, debugging, all that good stuff. Um, and that's where you can put like in that phase security. Uh, you can do things like uh, submitting and, and pushing and deploying your 
your your uh, artifacts, like maybe QA or staging, right? You can do all those things within that phase of your software development lifecycle. And then finally, right, deployment, which can mean many, many things. Um, but at this point, we're just going to deploy to to production. Now, if you notice, all these things have a a uh, circle with arrows around them to indicate movement uh, and iterative right processes. So these things are happening all the time, every time code changes. Uh, but again, you wanna make sure that you're aligning those bits with your software development processes so that they are just simply running efficiently and also um, as designed right within that higher level software development process. So one other way, to optimize pipelines, and this is a this is kind of a a thought that I had a couple of years ago. I noticed uh, just with my engagements in the community that you know there's a lot of people talking about how there's gaps within their software development teams, their release teams. Um, you know, they're 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 just not gelling very well, and the, and you can throw DevOps into the mix as well, where you know that concept there is where developers and operations teams are working, kind of simultaneously and understanding each other's roles. The reality is that's a really hard adoption and implementation to make, and it's never the same across the board for any organization or team. Uh, but what I'm proposing is, or what I've proposed in a blog post, which I'll share the link to later, is this concept of a continuous delivery engineer. And I know our industry doesn't need another role, right, or another another title. But I really believe that um, a continuous delivery engineer is kind of going to be the future. And this is why, right? So, like uh, in the blog post, I des I describe a lot more detail, which you can read later, uh, which I'll share that link. But essentially, there's two characteristics here that I define. Uh, one is uh, the, the kind of the human element for this role, like things you want in uh, an individual to, that's in a continuous delivery engineer position to, to have is like strong communication skills. I think you want that in every role, but it's, it's really important for that, for this role, in my opinion. Um, you want them to have a keen analytical skills, which means they're able to understand, you know, identify and understand patterns so that they can um, you know, decompose those complex patterns and processes and describe them uh, proficiently to folks who are not in the industry, right? They could be business stakeholders or people like that, right? Outside of the software or the technology kind of schema. Uh, and then you also want like proficiency in, in automating and optimizing these processes, right? So that um, you can also build competent uh, teams uh, and, and maintain that that uh, rapport with your teams, right? So they're all kind of tied together. And it's, it's essentially those characteristics are really important uh, to be successful in, in this in this uh, position. Uh, on the on the right side, we have some of the duties that I would imagine, you know, this position to have. Um, obviously, you are essentially the CICD czar, so to speak. So, um, you know, you would be responsible for uh, developing CICD principles. Uh, that's that involves, you know, touching the higher level software development processes and, and collaborating around that stuff to ensure that, you know, your pro your software development process are a direct reflection of your of your release cycles or release uh, processes, um, as well as um, review and modify CICD principles iteratively, iteratively, right? So meaning uh, just don't write the principles and, and guidelines that you're going to operate under, but go back and check on them uh, often. Um, also, right, you're going to maintain the tools and platforms uh, in, in some cases, right? So you will be the expert of the platform you choose, so whatever that platform is. Um, and you will also be helping to maintain, you know, keeping that thing alive or the, the, yeah, keeping that platform alive and functional so that you don't waste developer uh, cycles, right? Uh, and then finally, right, you're going to automate all your processes uh, and then maintain those pipeline configurations, which are what what defines your pipelines and what gets executed. So with continuous delivery engineer, again, it's just a role, something you may want to think about implementing uh, inside of your organizations. Um, so with technical optimization strategies, I, I, what I described previously was more of the human element. Uh, and, and what I'm going to describe further are more, you know, the technical aspects uh, that you can look for and optimize as well. So one of the main things I noticed that um, developers in general, like this is a, a, a common problem in the industry is 
uh, the lack of knowledge of their the languages, frameworks, and resources used in your text in the text tech stacks, right? So um, having proficiency in those languages is really important, and understanding the capabilities and limitations of these languages, frameworks, and tooling is also critical. Um, because when you know how those um, things work, you have the ability to kind of uh, quickly understand uh, when when things go wrong, right? Like why things are going wrong. Uh, like, you know, if you're having performance issues, the code is running slower, uh, you have a, an ability or at least some insight into where to look, right? To troubleshoot, to figure out why is, why am I experiencing this performance hit? Or maybe, you know, even bottlenecks, sometimes the software just you know, your data outgrows <laughs> the software it happens in a couple languages, um, your data sets, you know, that you're, you're transacting on within your languages uh, are, are just too big. Uh, and, and in some cases, um, you know, most languages and frameworks have this ability to run things again concurrently, right? So they have these concurrent capabilities. Uh, so you should be aware of these native uh, concurrency capabilities within your stacks to actually implement them when you need to, right? So if you're if you're if you're seeing like uh, you know performance hits, uh, and and uh, especially like I see this a lot with testing, um, the test suites, you know, as they grow, they become it takes longer and longer to to run the test suite because you're getting into that whole situation where you know you're cascading. So like you have to wait for one test to finish and then move on to the next. Um, in most cases, you don't have to do that. You can, uh, you know, uh, implement the the native concurrency capabilities in the stack, and then run all of those tests at the same time. This is similar to like the multi-threading concept, right? So um, again, you know, understand the, the the languages and frameworks that you're using because you can you can you know create some huge performance gains without even touching your CICD pipeline, right? These are things that can you can do natively uh, without even having to tweak a, a pipeline, which is really important because this is like a localized change. Um, now, what we're talking about next is tweaks, or, or not, not tweaks, but uh, concepts within the CICD pipeline. Uh, concurrent job execution is one of them. It's huge. Uh, you know, you have to ensure that um, your, your jobs are running uh, simultaneously wherever you can. It's not always possible, right, to, to execute a job without a dependency, but if you can run and orchestrate your jobs to run uh, as, uh, you know, uh, at the same time, wherever possible, do that, because that's where you kind of gain that velocity within your, your CICD uh, pipelines and release cycles. Um, avoid building job dependencies. Again, um, you know, what we talked about, like in the waterfall example, where things are like dependent upon each other, right? You can't start a new top, a new task. Um, and it kind of ties back to running things concurrently. Avoid any kind of uh, build dependencies if you can, wherever you can. Again, there's going to be places where you need to, you know, uh, have a dependency, like you have to stop a job or you can't continue uh, until a previous uh, job is succeeded. Uh, in some cases, it's a security scan, right? So you don't want to deploy or you don't want to move down your process uh, if you have some vulnerable uh, code that maybe has been detected, right, in, in one of your jobs. So, you know, again, avoid building uh, these dependencies wherever possible within your pipelines. But when you have to um, build those pipelines or those dependencies, uh, it's okay, right? Like, but this is the general rule that I like to go by and, and, and suggest. Um, so let's talk about uh, caching, right? So caching is, is um, you know, the ability to, basically pull down a bunch of files or dependencies or code or whatever uh, one time and then update things uh, only that the things that change um, it's super helpful so uh, we you know when you're when you're uh, running pipelines because the, the least amount of things you have to download the faster your pipeline is um, but I will warn you you know to use the cache cautiously there's uh, a couple cases where you know you're pulling down software uh, and you're pulling down all the software all the time that's not caching I've seen that quite a bit um, and then you know it, it's a it's a problem but then we're going to go ahead and talk about um, you know uh, only update the the change dependencies within your cache. That's that's the proper way to implement caching. Is you know the first cat the first run of your pipeline should download all the dependencies, and then from there, um, you know subsequent runs of that pipeline will only update 
the uh, changed uh, dependencies or, or the changed files in your cache, right? So, you know, keep that in mind when you're implementing cache because it can, it, if you're not implementing it properly, it can cause, uh, you know, a huge reduction in velocity uh, in, your, in your pipeline. Um, the other, this is a, this is more of a, a tweak, right? So if you notice like your pipelines are running on compute nodes, everything that you do in a CI CD tool is running in a runtime on a compute node, depending, you know, it doesn't matter. It could be a, a server in a data center. It could be, you know, bare metal server in a data center. It could be a virtual uh, machine in, in Amazon, whatever the resource class is in your CI CD tooling. Uh, please make sure that, um, you know, your compute nodes are adequately sized. They have enough memory, they have enough CPU, they have enough disk space, network, right? All these little, little uh, details uh, do impact your CICD pipeline if they're not properly sized. One of the biggest things I see is, you know, people add more code, things run slower, and then they just don't do anything about it. They continue to use the same compute node size. Um, when, you, when you do that, um, it's costing you money, right? Because you're slowing things down. Um, now, a lot of folks don't want to upgrade or, you know, to a more capable or more capabilities on their compute node because they, they fear the cost will, you know, be astronomical. I can tell you that that's not the case all the time. Um, actually, more likely than not, um, you will experience huge astronomical increases. Um, but think about it this way. When you implement a faster compute node, things are getting done faster. So that's shortening the amount of time you're using that node. Um, and, you know, it could, I've actually seen it be cheaper to run and on a, in a huge node, right? Then running on a on a, a slower, more uh, you know, uh, cost-consuming node. So you know, do your do your due diligence due diligence there. But if you want to increase some speed in certain aspects of your builds, uh, you know, make sure that your 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 nodes are properly uh, uh, they have the proper capacity. So um, test execution, this is really important. Um, you always wanna be testing your code, right? There's no question there, but you also don't wanna, there, I believe there's a, there's a thing as such as a over, you know, kind of uh, overkill for the test. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you're in the development phase, um, you don't wanna be running end-to-end -end testing all the time, right? On changes that you're making every time. So what you wanna do is scale that down to, and scope it out to more of a unit test, a type uh, execution, you wanna make sure that those tests are super fast, right? And, and keeping the developer going. Now, if you promote that, that, that build to a, uh, something like a, uh, uh, was it? Uh, yeah, if you're promoting to like a staging or QA, uh, then at that point you wanna run more extensive comprehensive tests. They're probably much longer, right, to run. So, you know, just, just keep an eye on when and how you're running your tests. And actually, there's one more other thing. Make sure that you're running uh, tests that add value. So, you know, if you're testing something and every time you run that test, it's green all the time, you should probably look into that test and add, you know, figure out, like, it's just adding value uh, because it's, it's always green all the time. Is it even functioning properly? Um, so, you know, those are kind of things that you need to check out uh, when you're running uh, test execution. Um, one other thing I wanna talk about is conditional job execution. Uh, this is basically how you orchestrate your jobs, right? So again, going back to that, that example of like, hey, maybe you're in that development phase of your code. Um, do you really need to run uh, certain tasks that pertain maybe to promoting things to production or to Q and A? Uh, type, uh, you know, uh, elements in your, in your software processes. Um, so, you know, you want to, again, align the uh, commands being executed within jobs to, to, you know, and scope them out to exactly what it is that you're performing. So again, if you're just, you know, performing uh, development of new features, scope those um, job executions uh, a little bit better. So you're not like, you know, doing full-blown, uh, 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 promotions across the board for no reason. Um, you know, that, that, that I see that all the time and it just adds more and more time to your overall pipeline run uh, and then slows things down quite a bit. Uh, you just wanna run those when certain conditions exist. And finally, I wanna talk about set, uh, uh, setting a, a build duration target. 
So this is essentially like every, you know, every pipeline is composed of many jobs. Um, what, what I mean by this uh, statement here is you want to ensure that the, every job that you run is being uh, run uh, optimally and, and within a certain time frame. So by setting a goal, I personally like to set a goal of 60 seconds. It's aggressive. It's unrealistic. But, um, you know, we need to we need to set these aggressive unrealistic goals so that whenever we see a job right going over like for me if i see a job going over 60 seconds um you know then i it's a red flag and then it brings my attention to it and i can look at it and see what is going on right analyze why is this taking longer um and you know it's like a troubleshooting kind of flag um but again right you want your pipelines to be very uh concise very very fast right because your the rest of your your release is depending on that your release cycles are depending on that on that quick velocity right um, so set your build target uh, build duration targets uh, very aggressively now of course right if you're sending jobs off to like Amazon or cloud build or something like that that's out of your control so you can't really you know if it takes three minutes it takes three minutes but at a minimum you know, that that job is taking three minutes because it's out of your control. And by the way, again, if it's, you know, the threshold is exceeded, that three minute average is exceeded, you need to look into why that's happening, right? So again, just, you know, set some uh, aggressive uh, build duration targets for every job that you run in your workloads. So that's basically all of the optimization bits. Um, I'm going to go ahead and recap, and then I have some questions, which I'll stick around for, even if we go over a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll definitely answer those questions. So let's go ahead and recap um, on the optimization of pipelines. Align your uh, CICD segments with your software development processes. Really important to keep those uh, nice because, again, uh, your continuous uh, delivery processes are a reflection of your software de uh, software development processes uh, establish uh, you know if you can establish a continuous delivery engineer or at least look into that kind of role um, it's definitely uh, you know like i said uh, continuous delivery is being adopted by pretty much everybody so it just makes sense to have like a, a central uh, team or or, or a central role that's kind of overlooking and overseeing and managing all of that uh, for for your for your teams uh, you know, understand the languages and frameworks and tooling that you're using, have a deep knowledge of those things because uh, proficiency in those technologies uh, will help you learning, you know, knowing the capacities, the limitations of frameworks uh, will definitely help you, you know, in, in many aspects. Uh, execute your workloads concurrently. That's always a, a, a motto that I've, I've, I've adopted years and years and years ago. And I try to execute that at, at every turn. Um, avoid building uh, job dependencies, right? Uh, like I said, there's going to be times where you just can't do it. It's just, it's impossible. You have to have a dependency, but wherever you can eliminate those, please do so. Um, and trust me, your life will be so much happier and faster <laughs> if you implement that, that advice. Uh, use the cache cautiously, right? And only update the changed things. Um, and then obviously uh, use adequate uh, compute nodes, adequately sized compute nodes with the proper capacities uh, whenever you're you know, implementing them inside of your CICD pipelines or you're executing CICD pipelines. Um, conditional job execution, don't run everything all the time. You know, try to filter out what needs to be run and in context, right? So again, if you're developing software in your development phase, don't run all the things right in, in your pipeline. Only run the things that you need to to progress to the next segment, and then finally set those build uh, duration targets. Uh, you can use my number if you like, sixty seconds, or you can build your own. Uh, but the the lower right the number, the faster things complete. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, I just wanted to share this link, which is basically the state of uh, the software delivery. It's a, it's a thing, a report that we've been releasing annually uh, for the past couple of years. Um, and it has a lot of data on how to benchmark yourselves uh, as far as like, uh, you know, metrics on what a, a, a high performing team looks like, uh, what kind of um, recovery developers are, are facing. And this is all data based off of the usage on the CircleCI platform. So it's pretty accurate. We do millions and millions of builds 
per day. So like, you know, we have a lot of data and we're finally, you know, making sense of it all and, re and releasing it to the public so that they can understand how they can improve their uh, uh, release cycles. Um, the CICD engineer uh, role that I talked about, if you want to read that blog post, um, just use this link. Uh, and there's an, actually another follow-up uh, piece to this that I wrote. Um, so it's been about a two-year project, but at the end of the day, I, I update it every year with some more thoughts and stuff. So, you know, if you want to get some more detail, go ahead and uh, check that out there. And finally, if you have any questions that I didn't answer here, um, join our discuss, or I'm sorry, join our CircleCI Discord server. Um, and in there, you know, CircleCI developer advocates, the rest of my team is in there and we're generally answering questions or, you know, talking with folks as well. So um, it's another way for you to connect. And that's about it for now. Um, let me answer some of these questions that are in the queue and then we'll finish this thing. Um, so one of the questions is, can we implement all of the CI CD tools in Docker? If we implement that, what are the pros and cons? Um, so like you can use Docker within the CI CD tooling. I think that's the question. So can I use Docker within the CI CD tooling? Yes, um, that's one of the, what we call executors, uh, which is that compute node I was talking about. Um, so you can use Docker images, you know, build your code on Docker images um, in, in CircleCI. That's not a problem. It's, it's actually encouraged, especially because developers, right, they're using Docker more and packaging their apps up. Um, so yeah, th you can definitely use that. Um, and the pros are that, right, it's, it's the same workflow. It doesn't really change for you. You can use the same Docker file, same code. Uh, the cons are there are limitations, right? So it is a Docker image or a Docker container. Um, there are performance issues as well. Um, you know, so if you're if you're looking to do like high performance things, I would recommend using a what we call a virtual machine executor, uh, so that you know you have the full control of the box. Uh, but that would be one of the cons. Is like you know there are limitations. Uh, can we manage? The next question is: uh, Can we manage CI/CD pipelines and jobs as code? without setting up everything using the UI. Do you have any recommendations for tools and practices? So um, yeah, so uh, there are many tools out there. They all do it, do, do the CI CD pipeline definition differently. Um, at CircleCI, like I said, uh, we use YAML. Most tooling uses YAML, um, but uh, what I tell people is when you're using Circle CI, you should not be in a dashboard unless you're, you know, checking on a status, like a, a feedback, right? So if your build failed, you want to obviously debug, you can do that. If you want to SSH into the box, you can do that with Circle CI. So like the developers can, you know, uh, debug in the environment where it failed versus, oh, here's a bunch of logs uh, that really don't make sense. And then you try to debug on your local machine, which is, nearly impossible or it takes a very long time. So yeah, you can do that um, within Circle CI for sure. Most other tools uh, also use, uh, you know, depending on the tool, uh, but you know, a lot of them have that code capability to define your pipelines uh, and you don't have to jump into a UI. Uh, so the last question I have here is, can you elaborate a little bit on avoiding job dependencies in concurrent job ex execution? Yeah, so um, avoiding job dependency. So uh, a job dependency would be, let's say you have a manual approval step, right? Uh, like let's say your pipeline's humming along and um, it has to stop because you have a, a rule that says a manager or some you know, person with authority needs to look at the state of the release at a given time. So maybe you have a... Uh, a Docker image that's gonna be deployed to a uh, maybe a production environment. Um, the dependency there would be that, that approval step, right? Um, you actually absolutely need that because maybe, like I said, you're bound by law uh, via compliancy uh, regulations, right? Um, so that's a dependency. Now where, you, where I'm talking about where you can eliminate that is anywhere else. You don't need that, just run things you know, concurrently. Um, like, okay, for instance, um, in my pipeline, I, I usually build using infrastructure as code, I build a Kubernetes cluster so that the release that I'm working on can be packaged up into a Docker image, thrown, or not thrown, but <laughs> deployed 
into a Kubernetes cluster. And then I can run some smoke testing, you know, to make sure that deployment is legit. And also to verify that that Docker image works in a Kubernetes cluster. Now, most people will do things like, you know, uh, build the, the cluster. And then obviously you can't deploy this built image until uh, that cluster is created, right? So that's a dependency, right? That you cannot break. You need the cluster before you can deploy. But all the other things like running unit tests, running security tests, building the Docker image and the Kubernetes cluster at the same time can be accomplished concurrently, right? So that's what I mean by, you know, eliminating, because a lot of people wait for the cluster to be built, then they'll build the Docker image, and then they'll deploy the Docker image. What I'm saying is, no, just do everything you can as, you know, quickly as possible, because if one of those fails, then the pipeline will stop. And then, you know, you have to go back and figure that out. So I hope I uh, answered that question regarding um, pipelines. And I think we're out of time, right? <laughs> I think so. Okay. All right. So I don't see any more questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you so much to Angel for his time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.